Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Figure This. Figure This is a speech training software that works to spruce up your language with more figurative language. Why say what you really mean when you can use something else to re- represent what you mean? This software is fabulous. And I'm not just saying fabulous that means good. I'm saying fabulous as in something worthy of a fable. So if you want to be more metaphoric, more idiomatic, more ironic, or more of any other type of figurative language subcategory, then figure this. It's a speech training software that will blow your mind. Because it's out of this world. No, it's the bomb. It's fabulous. Mention keyword engaged brain and receive 10% off your first month free. That's fee. First month free. No, first month fee. 10% off with keyword engaged brain. Figurative language is language that uses words or expressions with a meaning that is different from the literal interpretation. Language has long been one of the most fascinating topics to scientists for thousands of years, but even after all this time, our understanding of language is still fairly minimal. When you look even at even more intricate and confusing aspects of language, like figurative language, well, then we might as well just give up. Uh, today I sit down with Anna Aronson to talk about figurative language processing in the brain and how confusing the findings are, uh, especially depending on what tasks are used and what methodology are used. Checking looks good. Uh, so I'm talking with Anna Aronson about one of my favorite topics and my failed dissertation topic, uh, figurative language in the brain. Uh, and I'd like to know, I think you were just saying before we started recording, uh, what got you interested in figurative language? Um, I guess I've always been interested in writing. Um, and I've always been like very passionate about writing. So I kind of wanted to pursue um, like an inquiry into the neuroanatomical underpinnings and um, the sort of processes in the brain that enable humans to like abstract our language and to to complicate our discourse and I feel like that is what makes us like uniquely human is the way we can reflect upon ourselves and the way we can convey memories and emotions and aspirations to people we interact with and that can only be achieved through abstract language mm-hmm. and do you think abstract language or in the terms of figurative language, is complicating our language? Is complicating? No, is it complicating? Or is it making things more understandable? Ooh. Um, wait, like using figurative language? Yeah, makes, yep. I feel like it sort of uh, doesn't necessarily like streamline our thoughts, but I feel like it gives us a way to articulate some things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Mm-hmm. And also... I was telling you about this book, I think, in my proposal, but I read, I think it was called The Recursive Mind. Yeah. It was, like, yep. um, primarily, like, a neuroscientific book, but then it also kind of intersected with, like, cultural anthropology, archaeology, um, linguistics, and it was describing how humans possess this, like, recursive ability in the mind yeah. where they can embed themselves in their thoughts, and this, the, uh, the author argues that, like, this has enabled... Um, humans to like differentiate from other species and like eventually sort of catalyze like the on like the development of civilization and mm-hmm. human relationships so I, I'm really interested in that yeah I'm I, I love figurative language just because I think uh, it takes our experiences and uh, puts them into words so that we can understand things that we can't experience or can't understand yeah uh, so something like uh, trying to understand uh, like love or something like that, and I have to use like these terms of like temperature and heat. Uh, so like uh, I had a burning desire for her, or, or I was, um, um, you know, my former flame. Uh, all these kind of ways that we use experiences to understand uh, more abstract things. It was something like very like tangible and physical about words, which seems so like psychological and so mm-hmm. real. I feel like it's displacing like space time almost the way you orient yourself in this like abstract space 
which is very interesting. Yeah, and in terms of like memory, I, I've been trying to understand how our memory comes out in our language, uh, in particular, like how does someone who has memory impairments use language differently than somebody that doesn't have uh, language, especially when you're saying um, space time, like how we can kind of like transport ourselves with language across uh, different times. Yeah, no, that's so cool. <laughs> Uh, and in your research, what have been some of the like more interesting uh, findings? You were just kind of mentioning before we started recording that the research is a little muddled in terms of brain correlates of figurative language. Yeah, no, I'm still sort of distilling my approach. Um, I'm just sort of finessing all the different studies. Um, and so a few different areas of interest I've like encountered have been um, the, the sort of contested right hemispheric involvement. And because like normally... I guess we learned previously that like language is lateralized in the left mm -hmm. hemisphere, um, and then I was sort of investigating if like the right hemispheric contributions are more um, in like or in they sort of, they sort of like enrich the the creative or the associative mm -hmm. aspects as opposed to like just the literal definitions that maybe the left hemisphere is responsible for. So sort of been encountering kind of contradicting evidence. Um, with that, and then I also was kind of interested in like different types of non-literal language, so like irony versus metaphor, and I read an interesting um, comment that irony involves more like theory of mind, like it's more about understanding um, like very abstract ideas and like also reading reading what like another person is expressing, it's not just like your own interpretation of something, it's sort of incorporating the delivery, the inflection, and those are so many nuances to that. Wow. I'm just kidding. I was trying to uh, be <laughs> ironic in my... <laughs> uh, uh, jokes don't come out well on, on life. Uh, so, uh, I, yeah, I think it's interesting to see how in metaphor and irony and figurative language, you're taking like different representations and bringing them into one thing, uh, but that interplay of how you're representing them is... Uh, is different. So my poor attempt at humor uh, and irony at time, trying to you know express um, like surprise or wonderment, uh, but in a way that uh, is not that. Uh, with metaphor, trying to understand uh, someone being as uh, hungry as a pig, uh, trying to understand what pigs are like, what hunger, uh, what that person is, and what they uh, what that means for them. Uh, but that is uh, something that I came across too in uh, the like what literature are you looking at to find the contribution of uh, which hemisphere? Uh, so you, you look back to like, I think 1977, Winter and Gardner, they took patients with left and right uh, damage, the patients with the right hemisphere damage. Like, they had difficulty like comprehending. Right. Um, yeah, that seemed like more of like a neuropsychological approach. Mm -hmm. Like if they were, there was like some sort of impairment in the right hemisphere, then there'd be difficulty, yeah, comprehending like metaphorical statements. Um, there was another, Oh, I can't remember exactly what it was called, um, but it was like oh, semantic coding or something, uh -huh. um, or like coarser. Yeah, semantic yeah, coding, yeah. Like the right hemisphere um, codes in like a more um, coarse way, so mm -hmm. it can sort of comprehend like associations and relationships between different concepts, whereas the left hemisphere is good for like a literal definition of one word or like a singular yeah. uh, utterance or something then the right hemisphere is more associative. Like, I've been looking into that. Mm -hmm. I forget who specifically proposed the theory. I think it was in the 90s, so that was kind of further after the yeah. 1977 yeah. article. Yeah, uh, it's, it's been so long since I've been in the, that literature, I kind of lose track of people. I know one interesting person locally um, is a Haverford alum, John Chatterjee, uh, and he's done some kind of both fMRI and, I think, uh, some patient studies on, on metaphor. Uh, so Haverford uh, education can take you towards uh, <laughs> new heights uh, in, in trying to pursue the, your interests here. Uh, when you were uh, looking at your uh, the BuzzFeed article that you, uh, you produced, uh, have you had any kind of public response? Um, I don't think too much yet. I felt like I wrote it kind of like esoterically, and I didn't know how to sort of make it more like palatable or interesting. Mm -hmm. um, just because it's like such dense material I was like how do I make this like grab people and make it like internet savvy I guess yeah. I, I was just like struggling with that the sort of construction of the assignment like I really appreciated it because it made me think 
in a different way about mm-hmm. like sort of disseminating or um, distributing like academic research, like the different channels of like reception. Yeah, that I could take. you know, it's just it's so much different than anything else. Yeah, and at the CNS meeting I was just at, we had like a hour long session on using social media as scientists and what is our purpose or what is our goal on there? Is it to be funny or is it yeah. to educate people? Uh, and kind of those problems of taking something so dense and and specialized and making it entertaining. Yeah, it's hard. It's very hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so how about going forward? I, I know it sounds like you're kind of wading through conflicting literature. Do you think that there's something unique or important that uh, you want to mention or communicate about figurative language in the brain? Um, I guess since I found, I kind of like that I found so many conflicting articles mm-hmm. because I think that is sort of indicative of a depth or like a, a wealth in this in this subject that numerous people have recognized and I kind of want to trace the sort of processes for attacking that um, and even just getting a grip on like what figurative language is because yeah. like I said it like in I've read about like idioms and mm-hmm. um, metaphors and irony. irony. And yeah. There's just so many different intricacies, and it's, it's made me like conceptualize the way I think and speak in a in a different way. And now I'm sort of more like conscientious of when I'm using like a metaphor, like how I found that, like how I strung the words together. Mm-hmm. It's just very interesting because it's so it's like such an everyday thing that we do. But yeah. It's so complicated. Yeah, and kind of going off on uh, the rails here, uh, do you think that uh, your understanding, having this kind of richer understanding of uh, the brain's contribution to one aspect of language, is that going to affect you as a writer with your English major? Yeah, I think I think so. I, I really like this kind of like intersection that I found um, between, and then just like reading literature too, like or all the, like the literary criticism I've read. Um, it's all so like psychological um and just in so many books I've read I just kind of like to play with all the different metaphors and just like the structure of literature maybe mirrors the structure of our minds and that's that's getting like preachy in English but I'm sorry (laughs) no my uh, friend is doing a postdoc in uh, neuroaesthetics uh, which is the uh, appreciation of art using neuroscience tools that sounds amazing. Yeah. I want to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. I, I'll, uh, I'll send you her information. Yeah, uh, that'd be great. And she's only up the, the road in New York uh, at NYU. And I think uh, wrapping up the podcast, uh, something that you'd like to promote is maybe how you might get to New York. Oh, yeah. Um, Amtrak is pretty expensive. So Chinatown bus is 20 bucks round trip, Philly to New York. Um there's no light, there's, the aisles are tiny, I was on a bus with this guy just completely drunk on, like, natty light, but, you know, um, it gets you there efficiently, effectively, inexpensively, so it's, like, the college dream. I'm endorsing it. Perfect. (laughs) Uh, So we'll end there with our thoughts on uh, the brain's contribution to uh, literature and potentially us as humans. So thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. So thanks so much to Anna for coming in and talking about metaphor, another one of my favorite academic topics and something that I'll look to hope to study more in the future uh, and something that I have studied in the, in the past, uh, just uh, working uh, still to wrap my head around the findings that we found uh, before putting them out and publishing them. Uh, so uh, we'll look to start wrapping up the show, uh, just two segments here. Uh, no Jake's Jams today, but I do have some uh, Scholar notifications. So Scholar notifications, something uh, that's come through my uh, Google Scholar alerts or updates uh, that I find interesting and, and like would like to share. Uh, today I'm talking about a uh, academic cousin, I suppose, uh, Hilary Schwab, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher with Neil Cohen, uh, my academic grandfather. And uh, their new study in neuroimage called Medial Temporal Lobe Visualisticity and Relational Memory Performance. It's on a topic or a, a technique that I'd never heard of before. Uh, it looks to be kind of a novel tech neuroimaging technique. Uh, and so uh, looking at the abstract, structural and functional imaging studies have long uh, been among converging lines of evidence demonstrating the importance of the hippocampus in sex 
successful memory performance. Uh, but with this advent of a novel neuroimaging technique, magnetic resonance elastography, it's a hard word to say, elastography, MRE, uh, now it's a little bit easier with an acronym, uh, now makes it possible for us to investigate the relationships between microstructural integrity of the hippocampal tissue and successful memory processing. Mechanical properties of the brain tissue estimated with MRE provide measures of the integrity of the underlying tissue microstructure and have proven to be sensitive measures of tissue health and neurodegeneration. However, until recently, MRE methods lacked sufficient resolution necessary to accurately examine specific neuroanatomical structures in the brain and thus could not contribute to examination of st specific structural function relationships. Uh, however, in this study, they took advantage of recent developments in MRE spatial resolution and mechanical inversion techniques to measure vi the visuoelastic properties of the human hippocampus in vivo and investigated how these properties reflect hippocampal function. Their data uh, revealed a strong relationship between relative elastis elastic and viscous behavior of the hippocampus and relational memory performance. Uh, this is the first report linking the mechanical properties of the brain tissue with functional performance. Uh, so I, I new technique that I can barely pronounce uh, and bear, uh, have little understanding outside of reading um, this paper so far, uh, but it looks like a really interesting uh, new technique and I'm excited to see the uh, kind of advances that are being made in uh, neuroimaging. Uh, so again, uh, this uh, Scholar update uh, was um, in the journal Neuroimage uh, with the authors Hilary Schwab, Curtis Johnson, Matthew D. Uh, McGarry and uh, Neil Cohen, and it was called Medial Temporal Lobe Visuelasticity and Relational Memory Performance. Uh, so that was the scholar update or scholar notification for today. Uh, turning to the last segment of the show, uh, no uh, Twitter tweets, no reader mail yet, but uh, you can reach me at EngagedBrain on Twitter or on Gmail. Uh, you can uh, email me at EngagedBrainPodcast at gmail.com. I'll take any questions or suggestions and try to respond to them in a the future show. Uh, so that's it for today. This has been the Engage Brain Podcast. Thanks for listening.